Yeah, our next speaker is Flip. He's a, a repeat, uh, <laughs> a repeat guest here. Uh, he gave a talk last year around some live view app we could all play with if you remember if you were here. Otherwise, yeah, you'll find out. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's talking about a subject that uh, I uh, I'm very interested in. I actually messaged him directly to give this talk because I think it's it's really great because I was thinking about building some desktop or mobile apps and I saw his blog post and when I was like, yeah, you need to come and, and give this talk. Uh, so yeah, let's, uh, let's welcome Flip to the stage. Okay. So first of all, disclaimer, whatever I'm working on, it's highly experimental. It might break. It might not break. We shall see as we go. Um, uh, but, yeah, we, we, we'll we all feel the pain together. Um, so this is my premise. I hate Electron. It hogs all the resources of my computer, so I want to kill it as fast as I can. And I thought that Live View feels like a good framework to actually do it, but felt that the tools were lagging. So before all of that, a bit about myself. I am Philippe, I'm a developer at Superbase. Um, I work with the real-time product at Superbase. I've worked with the, the logging product of, of Superbase, also built in Elixir called Logflare. So yeah, basically Logflare during the day and the night and for long hours. Be careful and sleep. Don't, don't follow any of my advices. 3 a.m. is not a good hour to code. Um, so let's jump to what matters. If you want to build a desktop desktop application, what can you do? This is the naive way of looking at it, but you can do either native UI, where, sorry, you can do native with native UI, so all the elements look as your OS intended, everything looks really good, everything shines. The problem is um, you need specialized tools for that. So you either need to learn Swift, you need to learn, I don't know what for Windows. I have no clue. <laughs> Let's not talk about Linux because that's even a darker corner of the internet, I guess. So building native has a big, big, big bloated overhead on top of it in terms of development time. So companies tend to do what they do best, which is skimp on money and go for the easiest solution possible, which is not a bad approach. And that leads us to web views. Web views are basically glorified browsers without tabs, without anything, without um, Chrome branding, etc. Means that probably you already have a web page developed, and you can push that, and you can show it right away from day zero. You have a desktop application. Well, day zero depends. <laughs> There's some caveats to that. So easier to start, but the environment at the moment, uh, at the moment, it's getting better. And that's why I'm here and presenting something. But before one of the tools I'm going to present, it was bad. It was really, really bad in my opinion. Um, because let's put ourselves in the shoes of a company. You have a web app, you don't have any extra developers. So, I'll allocate one or two develops, developers to please give me something to put on a desktop because our client that's worth $10 million ARR wants something in their in their desktop for, for them and that's it. But we don't have, we want 10 million ARR, but we don't have a thousand to allocate. <laughs> <laughs> and it needs to be fast because it's a whale customer. Uh, it needs this by today, fast as you can, et cetera. So yeah, there's no way I'm going to hire someone, someone that knows how to build Swift. Sorry, Nuno. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to hire someone that does whatever Windows needs to do. I'm for sure not going to hire someone for Linux. I'll wait for the community version of it. Um, so we're going for WebView. So what are our options? So <laughs> Electron. The beast that started it all, that's the biggest compliment I can give it. Uh, <laughs> now, that, now, now really it's, it's 
I, I shouldn't bash on technologies. They they did something wonderful, which was open a new paradigm of if you want to develop front uh, if you want to develop a desktop application, you can do it with front end. That paradigm opened the doors for other developments. If it wasn't for them, probably this wouldn't exist. Um, and they basically, with their, their advantages and disadvantages, they paved the way to the idea of web views. They already existed in the past. They all, they've existed for the very, very long time, but they were the ones that basically said, okay, how can we do this in a fastish way? So they basically grabbed Chrome, well, the engine from Chrome, put everything inside the box. Here's a Chrome window, and that's it. Do just do the bare minimum to actually have a front end running. Um, but it again has issues. Uh, the binaries are giant because you're basically embedding Chrome V8 engine. You're embedding a bunch of other nicks and nacks all over the place. Um, and usually the binary ends up in in a really basic web applica web app web view uh, application around 200 megabytes if I'm not mistaken for the simplest HTML page. So it's a lot for not too much. Um, if you want to do anything outside JavaScript or TypeScript, you're gonna have a really bad time. Um, the tool I'm going that I use and I'm going to show as a concept of sidecars. Sidecars are basically applications that run on the side of your main application. So imagine you have the desktop window and then you have a secondary application. This secondary application can be used in any way you want. It doesn't need to be one application. It could be multiple applications. Electron doesn't have any of this. So you either do JavaScript and TypeScript or you don't do shit. Um, it's not the best language. It's not the best framework to do that. Um, and it's really tricky to work with. Uh, namely, so showing a web view, it's not the difficult part. Again, that has existed for the longest time. One of the biggest problems about desktop applications is actually the bundling, basically packaging everything into a proper binary, which is not real. The binary is a concept that it's not real for desktop applications. You basically bundle everything together, icons, uh, resources, whatever, into a neat package that your OS knows how to use. This part is really tricky. The other part is signing. There's an element where basically you need to tell the OS you can trust this, um, this application. And to show you how good it is, so they have a solution called Electron Forge. If I'm not mistaken, the last time I checked, um, which was probably during this week, can't remember when, time is relative. Um, the idea is you have a Docker image, you throw things and things come out, which is a, a con collection of tools that do the thing for you. So it's a black box of, I'm giving, it's literally the idea of you don't look how the sausage is made. You just throw meat, a sausage, sausage comes out, and you pray for the gods that everything went well in your Docker image. As long as you don't do Docker logs, then you probably see a lot of pain. Um, and again, this is from their website. So they're basically saying, yeah, we don't support this natively. We have a bunch of packages built by community, us, and whoever touched GitHub that can do this. Um, again, not dissing on the effort but I do believe there's better ways. And there's another options, another option, which is WX uh, widgets. If you ever went to IX and typed colon observer.start and you see a beautiful interface, well, beautiful for my eyes, not beautiful for anyone else, uh, with the supervision tree, uh, graphs that show the memory usage, this is what it's actually using. WX widgets is a really old um, framework uh, for, well, desktop applications that actually works multi-platform. It's a really good tool with really bad interface. And I think that's one of the reasons why people avoid it. But honestly, and honest as I can be, it's probably one of the best things you can do if you want to kickstart and have some fun. It's one of the best tools. But... <laughs> I'll, I'll go through the positives first. Um, it, it's really easy to integrate with the BIM. 
because WX is included within the BIM. There's a library within the BIM, uh, specifically specifically the Erlang site, where you basically do colon WX, and from that moment forward, you have access to WX widgets. This again, well, uh, Observer uses this, Lifebook uses this, uses this uh, to actually do the system bar thing, and it's a really good system. It's really good. Um, it also uses a more native approach to web views. Um, as I mentioned there, it uses WebKit for Linux and, and Mac OS, and uses Web Edge for Windows. So this is one of the reasons why it's lean. That's why this kind of bundling doesn't take 200 megabytes, because it uses whatever is already within the, the OS. In this case, um, you need to use WebKit, which basically is what Safari uses and whatever Linux uses. I have no clue, sorry. <laughs> and Edge, well, it's, I don't, I, for Edge, I'm not sure if it's using already the latest version, which is basically Chromium, no clue, but it uses the OS native stuff. So it's capable of adapting to the ecosystem where it's running uh, and makes the bundles way, 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 way smaller. It's really tricky to work with. Um, if we have time, I'll try to show in the end. I, I did a small demo for uh, basically docs on one side, a REPL on the other, uh, to try out Elixir commands while I have the document, the documentation on my side. Um, and if I show you the code, yeah, it, it's not pretty. And at one point I had to deal with binary flags where I had to say, okay, you have this set of permissions, so 00100. So you need to kind of, it's a bit lower level than it, than it should be, I guess. Um, and it doesn't have a good packaging solution. The proof of that, even within the live book repo, there's a thing called Elixir Kit. This is basically their approach to bundling, packaging, signing, and actually opening a web view and all of the things. Uh, and again, for me, I, I, I hope they release this as a separate uh, library because then if we add WX, the tool I'm going to use next would still be relevant and really, really good and I'd probably still use it. But for, well, for smaller things, this would be more than enough. Imagine that you just want a to-do list in your desktop and you don't trust anyone and you want a local to-do list. This would be more than enough to actually achieve that. You could package it, done, instead of trying to do something a bit fancier as we're going to try. Um, but if you, again, dig down into this uh, repo, as you can see, it calls Swift, it calls .NET, there's some nuances to it, and uh, I didn't delve too much into the code because, again, I think there's a better solution than this. If this is open source, it's a really interesting alternative. I don't think it's that alternative at the moment. And yeah, spoiler alert. This is what I'm using at the moment. It's it's a beautiful, beautiful system where they basically they captured all of the problems that desktop applications had. And not only web views, they, you can actually do a full native um, a full native uh, application using Tauri completely, but you also have, have the, the web view part of it. And they've built their own engine called uh, Y, with basically WR, Y, something like that. Um, and yeah, they, they, they've leveraged Rust and JavaScript TypeScript. So that's their main stack to actually achieve most of the things. And they have TypeScript and JavaScript talking with Rust. So you just have an interface layer of JavaScript and TypeScript and a logic layer of Rust actually managing most of the, the, the most of the things. But again, they have sidecars. And that led me to think, why not use those? The fact that you are able to do a stack agnostic uh, desktop application means that this solution doesn't just work for Elixir. It could work for Golang. It could work for, I don't know, Haskell, whatever you want, which actually opens the door to quite interesting applications. You can basically go, okay, I want my 
even using the normal Rust JS front end with native apps look uh, look and feel, you could have a sidecar going completely insane doing some other piece of code and feeding it into Tori. And that possibility alone opens a really interesting door of, of performance. Uh, as an example, you could potentially do something along the lines of, I want to do some local machine learning thing. Why not use Llama? Just have Llama as a sidecar feeding into Tori without extra Rust layers of complexity. You just go, this is my binary that I want to run, use my sidecar to do this specialized work, feed me the information, I'm done. Um, again, it uses the native approach for web views. It uses WebKit and Edge, the same, similar to WX. So the bundle sizes will be small. There's no packaged engine as a solution. It's way easier to work. Uh, I'll show you part of the code. Um, and the, the APIs are way more human. <laughs> you don't need to do zeros, ones, and, and whatsoever to define what the, what's the behavior you want. You can actually have Rust code defining what you, what you want to do. Um, and for me, the killer, the killer situation is when you adopt the Tauri system, this sounds like a cult, uh, when you adopt the, the Tauri, the Tauri uh, framework, let's call it a framework, uh, it includes the packaging and the signing. So one command does everything. And there's even a fun command for icons. If you give it a PNG, square PNG, it does all the icons you need. So even that kind of, yeah, it's really nice. You don't need a designer. <laughs> your company saves some money by giving, basically you ask your designer, give me a square with an image in the middle and that's your icon and you just run it. Um, so the solution I found, as I've mentioned is, I'm using the Mac OS example. You have a DMG, which is that neat binary, the fake binary that you're, when you install an app and you need to click and drag to the application, the only thing it's doing, it's basically moving a folder from that fake file system into a folder called applications somewhere in your home screen, uh, home folder. Um, so basically you're just dragging a folder with a bunch of information that Mac basically looks at it and goes, yeah, this is an application this is a binary. Um, Rai is the thing that feeds the, the web view. Uh, at first, I actually tried to use only Rai, but I would lose a lot of the good things that Tari gives me. So I kept everything, but Rai is the, 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 um, the library that actually runs the web views. So that's another good thing. Whenever something breaks, you might just be able to update one of the dependencies, which is Rai and not all the stacks. So that modularity within Tauri, it's really useful, um, which means that probably PRs, and they're actually really active. Um, PRs are merged way faster and you can just bump up Rai and everything should be fine. Um, I, I love that idea of not waiting for, uh, I don't know, a six month release cycle or whatever. I just pull this and even a fork and done, that's it. Um, Elixir is running as a sidecar and to actually do it, it's wrapped in burrito. So in this talk, we have Rust, Elixir and Zig <laughs> because for the ones that don't know, uh, burrito is a way to package Elixir applications as a single binary. And this is actually a single binary. It's not a fake single binary. Uh, and the idea is that it compiles, it doesn't compile, it basically, it basically squashes the the Erlang uh, runtime system into that single binary, along with your code, along with whatever it needs to actually run in the target development system. Uh, it's a really good um, library that I have no clue how it works, <laughs> but it's beautiful. Finally, inside the DMG, there's a resources folder if you actually need support files, something like that. By the way, there's I've left this here because there's a caveat I'm going to show you ahead. So this is the library I've built. Um, I wouldn't call it a library. I would call it a really bad experiment. <laughs> Frankenstein-ish, let's see how it goes. And kind of using Valim's way of, of speaking about this, it might not work. It might not appear like the type system, um, but it was heavily inspired by Tailwind. Um, they did something really interesting with Tailwind, which is 
instead of going um, in the README, what do you what do I need to install? You need Tailwind, DS script, whatever, or yes, build, whatever, whatever. No, you you actually install the dependencies within your underscore build folder, and you keep it keep them there. So instead of you being reliant on adding extra dependencies to the target uh, project, you can actually start the in, start it in the underscore build, which is really good because then it's one command instead of please brew install all the dependencies of the world and then you can actually use my library. So this was actually quite fun and Tailwind was <laughs> not gonna lie, a lot of it was copy paste, <laughs> delete a lot of their codes and um, graft my own. <laughs> this is what you need to actually start with, start the application. So you go to your mix config um, and you just say the version of Tauri you want to use, the name of the application, the host. Again, this is a sidecar, so basically we're using uh, an, um, a web server underneath. If I want full screen, the port that it's going to listen to. For example, I'm using a high port because, again, reserved ports. Can you imagine I want to use 400 for development and then my desktop app appears in my Chrome browser? Uh, not that good. Uh, and some other metadata that you can actually um, add to it. Then you just run mix install. It generates a folder called source story. The source story is um, composed by the tauriconf.json, which is basically a manifest. See it as a way to define what app is actually able to, uh, able to access what permissions does it have, what's the name of the sidecar, just a bunch of meta information that it's useful for your um, for, for your future application, for your desktop application. Um, I've decided to keep this, I thought about, okay, create it, delete it, et cetera. I don't think that's productive because leaving this here actually allows you to explore more and have more ideas and allow and disallow and just do Rust and some other stuff. What I do is basically give you the base framework of what you need. And this is almost all of the code. Um, you basically start the main process that starts the server. And if you see here, we really say command sidecar, start the desktop. And this is just telling Tauri, this is the thing you need to start. It starts or not, depends. Again, let's see how things go. Um, and then you need to do a check server. When we do the check server, the only thing I'm doing is really the most basic TCP connect. Is it open? No. Is it open? No. Is it open? Yes. Okay. Open the window. Done. So again, as lazy as it can be. <laughs> then we do mix story dev, which is where we are running now. So this presentation is actually a native app, uh, a native app running in a web view. And if I switch slides, you can see the logs down there here, basically going, yeah, back and forward, back and forward. So all this time, again, I'm lazy as hell. All the slides are just simple HTML code. And again, spoiler alert, at the moment, I actually need to do rec get to my static server. <laughs> again, spoiler to future work, um, but I'm basically fetching the slides and loading them into my live view. That's it. So as you can see, next slide, oh, uh, the app. The only thing I have here different, look at this. As soon as I open JavaScript, it's only errors. Uh, <laughs> the only thing I have, it's a hook that listens for our left, our, oh yeah, sorry. Go down terminal. Yeah. So I have a hook, really basic one, in that in the um, the main view, arrow left, arrow right, sends a push event on my event. I just push navigate because I wanted to have the slide page X, um, some pattern matching just to be fancy. But yeah, the only thing then it's okay. Render, get the correct slide, and that's it. And yeah, this is, as you can see, 
um, an application. It's not a browser tab. It's nothing to the point where I learned about Safari and Tailwind, Tailwind problem where age full takes into account the var of the URL. So if you do age full on, um, <laughs> on Safari, the screen disappears. <laughs> There's no presentation to anyone. So you need to do view 96, 97 from my testing, <laughs> view port type, but yeah, fun. Um, and then since we are here, no, let's continue and then I'll, I'll show the rest. Yeah, there's a command to, to do mix xtari build. This is the thing I'm going to show afterwards. Caveat, there's a bug. I'll show you afterwards. Um, and this, the only thing I'm doing here is basically whenever I see mix xtari, the only command I've built was the dot install. Everything else, it's basically passing commands into tari. Again, lazy. But I can show you, for example, that oh this is actually a good thing to show continue the other good thing is kill signals from the application are actually triggered uh, trigger the, the the sidecar to close this alone it's the best feature that ever existed the fact that you don't need to deal with store your pit okay my i received the sigint now i need to kill the pit associated with that and everything dies at the same time? No, Tauri handles that for you. And this alone for me <laughs> is worth all the, the pains I've suffered, uh, which were not a lot. But for example, whenever I do mix X Tauri, the only thing I'm doing here, it's wrapping with Burrito, where I say, okay, uh, run a release. It does all of the earth thing, compiles everything into a single thing, does all the magic for me. And done. And as you can see, waiting for the Phoenix server and just pops without any kind of extra pizzazz, which is good. When stuff is boring, it's a good sign. <laughs> Again, I'll show the build afterwards because I have a caveat that I'll explain later. Um, Again, limitations and future work. This is what I want to see the library in a couple of, hopefully, weeks, at least for a couple of this. Um, so Tauri gives you notifications. It gives you system bar. It gives you context menus. It gives you a ton of stuff, not to say shit, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> so my idea at the moment is, since we're already working with the web server, why not use WebSockets to actually talk with our sidecar. With that, we can allow real-time interactivity between Rust and Elixir, which would allow for notification pushing, which would allow for system management stuff. For example, I, if my layer of Elixir doesn't want to handle a file and I want my Rust layer to do it, do it. I'll just send a, a send event, do this. Similar to what we do with messages, um, just have a way to handle this kind of, of event. Um, the other thing I want to handle properly are resources. So Tauri, when we, when I've showed you the DMG, uh, the, the, the fake binary thing, there's a folder called resources. That's a really good solution because then I would read from a file instead of using a uh, rec to actually get a static element from my web server. This would also allow for SQL light stuff. It would allow, well, SQL light. I have an example with SQL light that works. The problem is it's stored somewhere and I don't know where. Um, and that's not a good good thing to, to have in your system. Uh, so it's better to for you to say, okay, look, everything is in the resources. And if you need anything, you know what to destroy, your your application knows where everything is, it's way better. Um, then again, all things that Tauri actually offers, system tray, multi-window, window menu, window customization. So you can do, I don't want to close it. I don't want full screen. I want my context menu to say, uh, I don't know, open file. It actually goes and opens a, a, a file system and pushes that into Elixir. There's a bunch of things that we can actually do that we're not using at the moment. The other two things are not under my control. Burrito is still a library you need to pull out of GitHub. It's not in X. 
because it's still in every development. So I don't feel okay with, okay, here's version 0.0.1, while one of the dependencies is in GitHub and not in X, because um, the, the main developer of, of Burrito is still really ongoing developing on this, uh, to the point where the first time I was developing the library, I actually had issues with it because there was some zig flag missing and one day everything was working, the other wasn't and was due to an open issue slash PR that I needed to wait for. Tauri will actually be at 2.0 soon. They already have a release candidate. It changes a couple of things around and I think they are actually making it even easier to work with. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, there's a, a message protocol you'll be able to use. So maybe even the, the WebSocket won't be needed, hopefully. Um, but yeah, something to that I would need to wait for and a lot of a lot of bug fixing more than more than the usage itself the bug fixing is something really required at the moment um and yeah that's my talk at least until we go into the pain of one of the caveats and the build system of it um i just have one request uh since we have a bunch of elixir developers here superbase um as someone from the community uh, pushing for a client for Elixir uh, that focuses on authentication, focuses on real time, and focuses on storage. So, if you are interested in taking a look, um, it might be a good project. Even if you're just starting with Elixir, it might be a good project to just jump in and go with it. Um, and a big shout out to the user that actually started all. I don't know how to pronounce that. So it's so it's Zoop. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, she started the initiative and it's actually going quite well. Um, and yeah, that's basically it in terms of me pitching it. And now I can actually show you the pains. I didn't want to risk everything just blowing up. That's why I waited for this. But if you do Tauri build, no need to, to write it again. then it starts to do the rusted stuff. It's just the, there's a bunch of rust that I'll never understand. It, it, this is when it's building the DMG thing. So it opens this every time. So I'm a bit tired of that window. <laughs> <laughs> and after all of that, there's actually the DMG file here. Give me opening finder. And again, this is the beautiful part. Again, I didn't do anything. I haven't signed anything. This is done with one command and it took a couple of seconds, but if I double click, I can drag and drop. If I go to finder, where is finder? Oh, I love this part of, yeah. Here's my app. And to show you that it wasn't there, I, I can actually replace it. And if you open it, it actually works. <laughs> well, now, now comes the disappointment. The sidecar dies, <laughs> and I'm not sure why. <laughs> so again, highly experimental. Um, but to give you another example uh, of what you can actually build and why I think this is Really interesting for, I hope this works. Um, really interesting for Elixir now, mainly now, it's because of uh, Bumblebee. So this was the app I used for the blog post where I use Bumblebee with a Grammarly uh, machine mo model, learning model they have. And um, no. I'll trust you, famous last words. Um, and I basically just used Bumblebee to actually run whatever I needed to do. Um, and since I can do a desktop application out of it, I thought, why not build my local Grammarly? Grammarly or AI yeah, Grammarly, uh, which removes all those concerns from the security team saying that that's a keylogger. Uh, <laughs> we thought are correct. Um, I hope it works. Probably it won't. 
Oh. Uh, yeah, probably it won't work. And I think it's because potentially it's actually pulling all of the model at the moment. So a couple of gigabytes <laughs> of the model. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why the resources folder might be useful because then the model could be bundled with the resource and you just build the bundle once. Or you could have a startup system that it's way smarter than just do whatever you need. Uh, but I think that's the problem. It's just dead in the water because it's pulling the model. Yeah, Elixir is running. It's just pulling a lot of information for NX. But yeah, I, I might, I'll keep it here. If it works, it works. Uh, so I can take a couple of questions. <laughs> Thank you. No um, what's one of the biggest issues or problems that you'd like to see? Not this or maybe the foundation is on your branch. First of all, the sidecar working after bundling it. <laughs> the Honestly, I'm quite happy where it is. I think the biggest problem is really being sure that it, it's, it runs on multiple systems. That's one of the things. That's one of the problems of Burrito at the moment. Um, for example, CI for Burrito, it's hell. Uh, the developer at the moment, if I'm not mistaken, needs to test in each computer. Uh, <laughs> I have a Windows, I have a Mac, I have a, <laughs> a Linux. Try it, try it in all of them. Um, and that, that's the kind of annoyance with desktop applications. Uh, so, but again, in terms of usability, there's not much. It's more adding features and fixing those bugs, those small bugs. Small, well, big, may, maybe small in, in scope when I find what the hell is happening. Um, but yeah, overall, I'm actually quite happy with, with it, mostly because of what Tauri actually offers. I can actually show you the codes while <laughs> the model probably is downloading, I guess. Um, if we open. If we if we open the lib, the only thing I'm doing, it's just uh, X story. Yeah. It's 280 lines of code. So nothing i'm getting a bunch of options being loaded i install tauri with cargo which basically it's what tailwind does uh not with cargo but basically they install tailwind so that's why i'm heavily based on it i initialize the project which is the thing that basically creates the source story folder um and then it's just patching a lot of options <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing special again it's going to tauri config change these values um instead of the default ones and this is due to a limitation on tauri side there's not a lot of options for the cli init command so there's a bunch of things i actually need to modify on the the, the manifest and the other thing i have it's basically the here here's the cargo toml for rust um this is another reason I want to keep the files there because then you can add more libraries to it and just have fun with the Rust site plus the Elixir site. So imagine Rustler without the limitations of, basically Rustler with a long running process because that's one of the limitations of NIFS. Um, and the source code where I just, <laughs> in the middle of a multi-line thing, I just have two, two arguments I need to post. Um, this... This kind of stuff, I'd probably like um, uh, a better templating engine to actually handle it because having this art coded like this, it's not a pretty display, but it's actually how most things we use actually work. For example, I think it's uh, Phoenix still uses this kind of templating to actually generate a bunch of files. Um, and the other thing I have here is just the burrito wrap, which is here. I just call mix mix task run and handle some caveats with the naming of the binary and that's it. So Gary, it's a really naive solution. Most of the work is being done by um ex, uh, by Tari itself. So that's why I'm I'm okay with the state of the library when I iron out all the bugs. Um 
But overall, I think it's a really solid approach. I think it has really good, really good capabilities to move forward. And again, it's not, it's stack agnostic. It's not focused on Elixir and live view. You could do this with whatever you want. And that's one of the beauties of it. So all, all the kudos go for, for Tauri. They've built something that it's highly, highly, highly impressive. And if you follow them, you'll see way better examples than I did. <laughs> you get the chance to compare the performance difference between like a classic live view in a browser on the next and the, the, the Tori. Uh, no, no, I didn't. I wasn't able to, but. Even manually? No, no, no. The only. I didn't try that, but for, actually my development for the, 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 the slides was basically open a browser, do it in the browser because I hate Safari mm -hmm. and then, okay, does it work on, does it work on Safari? It does then go back and forward. Um, I didn't notice any difference other than the tailwind quirks, uh, mm -hmm. performance is good. Nothing, honestly, nothing that I can, I can see at the moment. It should run hmm? <laughs> yeah, 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 easily, easily. But I'll, I'll trust you to do that. <laughs> you are the Doom Master, not me. I have a question. Uh, would we use this to, so the same concept of running a sidecar, all that, to do mobile applications? No, I doubt it. Um, there's another, there's another project, I think it's called Desktop. Um, someone for Desktop? I think so. Yeah. And I think they can do mobile. Yeah. At least they've mentioned they were able to run live book in a in an iPad. Um I doubt it you'd be able to do this with the sidecar because since it's loading the fuller lang um the fuller lang virtual machine, the runtime of it, I doubt a lot of mobile devices would give you permission to actually do it. But Tauri, again, Tauri is awesome, and they actually have um, they have the capability of you building mobile apps with Tauri. Mm -hmm. So, in an extreme scenario, what you could do is um, do your live view thing when it's in your desktop, you fit it locally. When it's in the um, in the mobile side of things, you fit it with your server. Mm -hmm. It's not elegant. I doubt the sidecar would work. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. But I think they are using, they are running Erlang in the device in its local host. So maybe it I hope so. <laughs> so yeah. I'm waiting on Burrito to say, yeah, you can package this into, I don't know, an Android slash iOS um, okay. binary, and then probably the sidecar would work because the sidecar is just an abstraction Tauri uses. So I guess you could do more stuff with it, uh, but I, I honestly, I have no clue. Okay. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you.